Hello, folks. Uh, we are back with another episode of Hama Live. Alive. Um, it's, it's been a little while, and I, I'm on the you know, there's a lot going on uh, since our last since our last uh, episode, our last broadcast. Um, so, um, you know, we're, we're going to start back with a topic um, that's near and dear to a lot of us here in, in the Hama community, and uh, that's that that shields. Um, but uh, we are just we're just so grateful to be back, and um, I have some special guests with me today. Um, this we're going to keep this in house. So um, I am. Uh, Damon Osa Cunningham, and uh, I, I am the vice president of Hama. And um, up first, our first guest is Damon Stith. Welcome, Damon. What's up? What's up? Damon Stith is the president of the Hama Association. Uh, up next, I would like to introduce. Adam Mansa Marie. He is the Chief Operating Officer for Hama Association. How you doing there, Adam? I'm great. I'm great. How are you? I'm great. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Good to see you guys. And finally, last but definitely not least, I want to introduce uh, the newest member to the Hama Council, um, our curator of research, Kari Evans. Hello, Kari. Welcome. Hey, how are you doing? We're doing. We're doing good. We're doing good. Um, I, I need you folks to um, uh, bear with me. I, it's been a while since I've been, you know, on, on, back on this platform. So um, you know, it, it, it's. I kind of have to refresh myself with this. Um, but this, this is going. That, that's why I'm starting back with you folks because this is going to be a. Uh, it's going to be a nice, nice, easy day. Okay. Um, so we're here to talk about African shields. Um, and this was actually uh, the brainchild of Kari. So, Kari, would you want to take a minute and tell us why you came up with how you came up with this idea? Yeah. So basically, you know, I look up all different, you know, sources for information. So I've been looking at, you know, YouTube and from the HEMA side of things, it's been a lot more interest in shields and shield work. And, you know, people have been exploring, you know, different ways to use them and things like that. And I said, well, we're HAMA, you know, we have shields. Shield work is actually really important. Shields are very important to the type of warfare and the type of martial arts we do. So we really need to put that out there for people. So that was my inspiration. Okay. okay. And it, it just so happened to um, coincide with uh, uh Adam Mansa Marie and his new uh, viral hit TikTok page. Um, he, he has a video that I, I, I wanted to share with you folks. So I'm going to pop this up real quick. You asked and I'll deliver. Here are some of my favorite shields from around Africa. We start our journey in Central Africa with the Azande shield. Made with wicker and wood, it had pockets in the back that allowed for a warrior to carry additional weapons like extra spears or throwing knives. Its size and shape allowed it to be used in mass battle formations like this one right here. Our next shield takes us to the Maghreb for the Moorish Adarga. This particular shield was made with ibex hide and can be carried both center grip and up on the arm. Interesting note, the shield was adopted by the Spanish after the Reconquista and was actually carried to the New World. This design is from Mexico in the early 20th century. This is the Beja shield from Sudan. Traditionally, it was made with rhino hide, hippo hide, or elephant hide and is incredibly tough. It's still used today in traditional dances. Next, we go to South Africa for the Ishwangu shield, which comes in varying sizes. This particular size was designed by Shaka Zulu to be paired with the Ikhwa. Last but not least, we go to my favorite, the Egyptian Kalkan. This wicker and metal shield was imported by Turks and used by the Mamluks. It can be held on the arm while shooting an arrow or carried on the back. Tell me in the comments what else you'd like me to cover. Cheers. Nice video, man. Thank you. Thank what, you. What, 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 what spawned you to make that video? Well, so when I started TikTok, um, I decided that there, there wasn't really a proper hammer presence on the platform. And I, I thought this would be a great opportunity to uh, throw out some quick one minute bits of things to give people some foundations to research. So, okay. so uh, I started off with swords and swords seemed to be really popular. So I moved on to axes and architecture and shields and... You know, a lot of these are questions that come from the community on TikTok. So they'll ask a question, and I'll do my best to answer. All right. Okay. Well, so today, 
Um, this, this is going to be this going to be a loose loose chat, you know, loose format. Um, basically, we're just going to take a nice trip around Africa. Uh, you know, Africa is a very big place, and, and in there, you know, there is a lot of diversity. Um, you know, that that's it, it's a misnomer that um, you know that Africa is homogenous. Um, a lot of people like to put Africa in one big pot and and make it hom homogenous, but you know, technically speaking, it, it holds the greatest amount of diversity you know, on the planet, like, you know, um, in, in Africa. So, you know, we're just kind of going to, we're going to take a turn and we're going to talk about our favorite shields. Um, this, this topic is so deep that we, we would be here forever. Uh, so, so we're just going to keep it light. This might turn into, uh, you know, a, a, a series. Um, but one thing that Kari mentioned was the possibility of setting up a page or, or uh, something afterwards. So I, I think what we'll do is we might we're probably going to set up a, a, a Facebook page about African Shield where we can continue this discussion, and I'll make sure that I'll put it in the comments. Um, so why don't we start with uh, El Presidente, uh, Daman, and uh, why, why don't you pick a shield to start with, and uh, we'll take it from there. All right. So let's start at the beginning, I guess, or one of the beginnings. Um, let's go to Egypt. And um, I want to firmly align Egypt on the continent of Africa, just in case folks didn't know. Um, as we can see here, uh, Osa just posted uh, this Middle Kingdom style shield uh, that's used by these Egyptian soldiers here. Um, if you notice the shape, it has that uh, that point. It's like an upside down heater, sh uh, heater shield. Mm -hmm. And this type of horizontal grip shield is very, very rare on the continent. Um, you see also uh, during some traditional stick fighting matches in, in ancient Egypt where fighters are using shields braced on the arm and very rare, this is a very rare configuration, shield configuration on the continent. The only place I've, been, I've seen a comparable uh, shield, you know, use of shield is amongst the Nuba people in Sudan who use a plank style shield uh, for stick fighting. As you can see right there, um, this right here is, it looks almost identical to what the uh, iconography depicts in ancient Egypt. Uh, what we do know, or what we, or so what, what, what happened or what, what's, um, um, what, towards the, the new kingdom, the shield styles changed. So they, they shifted from braced shields to center grip shields, which are much more common on the continent. Now, um, you see this right here is an example of a, of a shield with a backing. If you were to take that backing off, it will look ex almost exactly like some of the peri sticks you'll find in East Africa. Um, yeah. So um, one of the reasons why, one of the theories as to why this the shield shifted from this brace on the arm, uh, apex style shield to the more tombstone style shields where, you know, it's center grip had to do with military technology at the time. So uh, during that transition from the Middle Kingdom to the New Kingdom, where the fighting was primarily uh, close quarters fighting, the Apex Shield was king at that time. Now, when uh, bow technology improved, there was a need to offer more coverage from, from the archers. So they developed this, this tombstone style shield, allowing the person to keep the shield away from the body in order to protect themselves a little more. Still useful in close quarters combat, but you can see how just the slight, the slight uh, technological shift uh, changed how they uh, were carrying shields in the shape of the shields. Okay, okay. All right. Um, gentlemen, any comments or anything about that? Well, I find that um, what, I, what I like about the, the Egyptian shield is the amount of coverage that it offers. I mean, Sometimes when we think about shields and weaponry, we don't often think about how it's used in combination with the weapons and armor that a person would be carrying at the time. And if you are an unarmored warrior in ancient Egypt, a big shield is probably among your best defenses uh, because you know you don't want to uh, you want to make sure that you're not you're not getting hit on any vitals. And if you notice the size of it, it basically goes as the as they say in the movie 300 from the knee to the neck, which covers yeah. most of the vital organs and the arteries that could uh, that could accidentally get cut up when the fighting gets uh, gets a bit disorganized. 
you make a really good point about uh, the comparison of the shield with armor because it's it's of my opinion, especially given the the climate, that large shields, large mobile tough shields, was the way was the um, the reason why there's you find very little body armor in some of the cultures. Um, if you think about some of the mentions in uh, the uh, the Sudanic tariqs, where it mentions uh, the, the histories of, of, the, of the fighters in the Sudan, um, you mentioned even in those cultures where they're wearing like mm. chainmail and and quilted armor, the troops overheating, getting too hot. But if you have a very large, nimble, tough shield, it it, it counters that 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 um, those constraints that you will encounter with the, with wearing body armor. So yeah, yeah, I I can speak to that because you know we see that not only in Egypt, but if you go into West Africa, you go into East Africa, you you see that you know they favor these you know large shields you know made out of the different materials of the area, and one of the things is that when you're dealing with armor you know, that is the armor because like the environment. And I think that's something people don't really understand is like you're dealing, if you're talking about Egypt, you're talking about, you know, you know, you have the Nile and stuff, it's lush and green, but you go outside and you're in the desert. Like, you know, you go to, you know, the Sahel and you're in a semi-Arab region. You're, you go, you know, if you're in the desert, then it's like hot and you don't really have the ability to carry, you know, thick, heavy armored garments and things like that. So really they rely on, you know, these protections, these shields to protect them from harm because they can't really compensate with, you know, mail and things like that. We see those things entering, uh, you know, in the 19th and, uh, you know, 17th century, things like that. We see them start using some of that thing, but it's still at, you know, a significant risk to them. And, you know, there's stories about people you know, going out in the battlefield in their mail helmet and, you know, and their, you know, their chain mail and overheating, you know, mid battle. So, yeah. you know, these shields is, is actually, it's not like a lack of it. That is the technology of this area where, you know, you have this intense heat. Now, one thing I wanted to say about uh, the Egyptian shields is that like the way they're held. And so I've seen discussions, people were talking about, you know, having, the vertical grip versus the horizontal grip. And you find shields with both of them. But when you think of Egypt and how old a civilization Egypt is, they had to lay the foundations for what a standing army really was. And I've heard some people talk about that horizontal um, grip being kind of like to reinforce like unit formations and things like that. Because when you hold it horizontally, the way you have to carry it, it, it you know, kind of creates cohesion and the same thing if you look at tati like how the strikes come in and things like that it also kind of goes into like working as a unit being a you know a big unit and fighting rather than fighting as individuals and things like that so there's a, there's you know even little things of how the grips are made show like the use well, well that that would kind of make sense if, if you compare it to uh the roman scutum which mm -hmm. which uh you know, some of them. I think the early ones actually had the horizontal grip yeah. as opposed to as, as to the vertical one. Um, but I, I I wanted to you know, Demond mentioned the parrying sticks. So um, he, he said how the the shaft and the support of the Egyptian shields uh, mimicked the parrying sticks um, can be found in East. In, in East Africa, um, so this is a parrying stick from uh, I think this is this is Dinka. It's a Dinka parrying stick, and um, you know it, it's, it's a, and it is an extremely simplistic uh, weapon. Uh, you know, I, I I believe that this was the this was the precursor to to, to the shield. Um, yeah, I think uh, you know I think the stick fighting. Um, African stick fighting was, was was ingrained in the culture because mo a lot of African cultures are pastoral, um, and there there's a the man who, who was the, who was the doctor that wrote that paper that made the 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 uh, oh. connection between stick fighting and pastoral communities. 
Uh, you're talking about uh, TJ, Dr. TJ Dash Obi, or I, I believe so. The brother with the, with the, I think he had locks. Okay, I, I he he had a he had a he wrote a paper. He did a presentation one time. I listened to. It. He did a presentation and he talked about how um you know yeah. he believes that stick fighting is such a prevalent thing across Africa because it's it's a pastoral uh, uh pastime. You know the, the young boys are the ones watching the herds. You need the sticks. You know what happens when you put a bunch of boys together with sticks? They're gonna find out who's best with the sticks. So you know, at, you know I don't want to get hit. So I'm going to use this stick to block, and then out. I got my knuckles smashed next last time. So I'm going to take a piece of dried something and put over top of my knuckles, um, and then you know, and then in time, that gets bigger and turns into a shield. Um, but another thing that I like about the 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 Denka is um, they have another kind of parrying shield. Um, like this one and this one. That's that's the one. Basically, that's a it, it's it's a log. It's a it's a light wooden log um, that they've carved a handle into, and they've covered it with skin to help um, st you know strengthen it, make it tougher. And this, if if, if my research was correct, um, this kind of shield defensive uh, item was paired with a club. Mm. And this was used during non-war times to settle disputes. So unless we have declared war, you were not allowed to, to use your sharks. So you couldn't you couldn't use your blades, you couldn't use your spears, you can't use your swords um, unless war was declared. Now, this is, you know, some secondhand stuff I read. So I, I, I'm still looking for firsthand sources on that. So you have to take it with consideration. Um, mm -hmm. But just the fact that, you know, they set up a, a system of disputes um, that wouldn't be bloody is brutal, but not bloody. Um, and, and, and this, you know, it, it's pretty simple, you know, but but, it, but it's probably so effective um, in providing protection for, for folks. So that actually um, gives me some some because uh, I'm on this. Um this combat conditioning thing. So that gives me some ideas of making a, uh, a, 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 a shield, a shield weight trainer to kind of get your, get your shield game up. Um, um, one thing I wanted to riff off of when you were talking about the, the, the parry stick being kind of like the, the earliest type, the earliest shield, the first shield, I would go so further as to say that the stick, the, the stick in the offhand, and then even the spear in the offhand, being the first being like one of the early early um devices for defense so and, and we still see this type of configuration one documented in egyptian iconography where you see stick fighters fighting with dual sticks or fighting with stick or throw stick or axe in one hand with spear in the other hand uh you see of course uh takoba fencing where uh tuareg are using the takoba with the ayar uh, the alar, excuse me, um, in Wasan Sanda, a house of stick fighting, um, they couple the takoba with the stick, and they use this stick as a as a shield. And you know, ancestors and gods blessed them because they 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 put their hands out there for you know you know not it with 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 one hundred percent confidence that they're able to like you know parry and actively knock down these attacks that come in, and so you see this type of configuration. And then, then you mentioned the Dinka. There's a few old um, colonial uh, pictures of Dinka. Dinka, or Newar, I think it's Newar. Newar um, uh, men uh, stick fencing and they have a clutch of spears that they're using as shields in their, in their fighting. You know, so I, I think that, that that using that stick as in the offhand first, you know, and then eventually, like you said, you know, as we evolve, we get better and better and, you know, more efficient. And then it's like, you know, boom, we have the full, you know, the full link shields that we, that we know and love today. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, Kari, have you talked about, do you talk about your favorite shield yet? Um, so I've kind of just been studying one shield right now. Cause like I take a kind of immersive a approach. So I've been looking at the AR of the Toreg people. Um, so that's a picture of me 
um, in my parking lot with the one that uh, Osa actually made for me. But, you know, I've been messing around with it um, for various reasons. But one of the, the things is I really like the design because to me, it's a shield that is a compromise between uh, offensive capabilities and defensive capabilities because with the shape, it's, it's a very large shield. Um, they range about uh, four feet to 4.5 feet, and they're about uh, two feet across. And, you know, it covers basically, you know, your entire upper part of your body, your entire lower part of the body, depending on where you put it. And with the different uh, little dips, they have one on the top and one on the bottom. One on the bottom is not as pronounced, but you can, you know, use your sword in like an overhand or, you know, angle in really, really close and when you see a lot of larger shields, what happens, like like a wooden shield, like like a Roman scutum or something, you might get in a situation where it's like the top of the shield, you have to like really go over it, but you have that that cut in. And so you can still attack with it and you still have good visibility. It also lends itself well for working with both sword and spear. It doesn't really uh, change up how well you can use the shield depending on what weapon you're using. So like I like that too about it. Um, and, you know, they're also cool because despite them being such a large shield, they're actually really light. I mean, this is something you find in common with a lot of African shields, but these are not heavy things. As big as these, they are and as much protection they have, you're talking about at most two to three pounds, if that. A lot of them, like 1.5 or, you know, so because they're like lever shields, but the, you know, the hides and, you know, the materials available you know, in these regions are like the best in the world. Like if I, you know, if you were going to make a lever shield, you know, like the Lamont, which they made that out of, and they had a special process to tan it or whatever, all the accounts say cannot be pierced, can't be stabbed, can't, you know, it's impenetrable, you know? And then besides that, they would add, you know, they had inscriptions and stuff to fervor the, you know, protection of the item. But these shields were serious defensive equipment, you know? So... One thing, if I can, just to riff off of that, um, one thing I really appreciate with about Tuareg shields and then just um, other other shield types, but more specifically in in the AR, is the is the shape of the the spear, shape of the shield, excuse me, and then the uh, the uh, the smaller shapes on the inside. That from my research, these are referencing like feminine protective symbols. And um, and when you look at the shape, the shape is is kind of indicative of this of this you know this feminine goddess, feminist feminine mother. And I just like that. I like it. It kind of connects with Tuareg being matrilineal, and the idea that this shield is like your your um, your your protection, but it brings in this the the strength of the of female female presence and power. And I I think that's really interesting and notable about the culture, even when we're talking about the Takoba, the use of, um, you know, uh, golden metals like brass or copper uh, to balance out the, the destructive steel and stuff. So I like the, symbol, the, the symbolism that occurs with the constructing of these weapons and these, these defensive items. And you, you see that they're not to put Africa in like one homogenous, you know, lump, uh, but it is beautiful to see some some commonality um, across the continent in the idea of defense is not just this cold technical thing that you just do. It's like it's a it's a deeper interrelated thing that has to do with how you move, how you position, and even how you are like mentally, spiritually aligned, you know, with your items and stuff. And that's like a a really cool, uh, unique thing I think to African martial arts and weapons. Yeah, right. we, we got we got a question here. Uh, we got a comment. Uh, are y'all going to discuss the manufacturing methods for leather shields, the types of leather used, and how protective they were? It's from uh, Omar Omar Nawab, and he he sent this to us from our uh, our YouTube page. Um, so I can say. Yeah, I was going to say no, no. I, you should, you can speak to how they're constructed. I can probably add some some context into like how protective they are. But okay, yes. Yeah, well, I, well, let's let's start with um. I, I mean, well, 
leather, so many different types of leather shields. So first you have to start with what each shield is made of, what kind of leather it is. Um, the, the, the Tuareg shields, I believe they were mostly the, uh, the Oryx, uh, Oryx is, is a big old gazelle. I mean, it's a, it's a horse looking gazelle, um, very thick hide. Uh, but that is probably the largest, um, animal besides the camel, you know, the non-domestic animal, um, that they had access to, um, in, in, in their part of the, the Sahel. Um, if you go over to um, the e East Africa, you, you know, you're going to get some rhino, you know, you're going to get uh, some, some elephant. So, you know, each, each, you know, then, then in the South, uh, South Africa is, um, it's cattle, you know, cattle hides, cattle hides. The Zulu shields were, 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 were famous, but they, they were cattle hides. So, um, as Kari mentioned, I'm, I'm, I'm made some shields. I actually, I made this one right here. I, I made a few others. Um, and I started with the Zulu shields, the Guni shields, because, um, that's really the, the, the only information that I could find, um, Omar or on, on how and construction methods. And it was pretty simple. Uh, basically they said the, the hide was scraped and clean. Um, it, it was, it was pegged to, so you would take the hide off the cow, you would peg it to the ground. Where you scraped it and cleaned it, um, and it was left out to dry, um, and then it was put, it was buried underneath the cattle, uh, the cattle pen, for however long, a couple of days, a week, or whatever, and then it, then it was then it was dug up and it was used. Um, so in, in my exper in my experiments, um, I did the same thing. I scraped them, um, and then I, I what I believe what it is is I believe they were urine tanned. I believe that uh, that the, that the urine and, and a little bit of the, the feces created, you know, the enzymes from the feces. But I believe so that it's mostly the urine. Uh, urine, if you you know, and then I and I was able to research urine tanning, which is a thing. You, if you if you pee on a piece of leather, um, you know, a piece of skin, venture enough times it turns to leather. Um, so you know, so that's kind of how how I started with my. Um, with my Zulu shields, um, I replaced the urine with, uh, high, you know, with, with high acidic things. I, I've used vinegar. I've used lemon juice. Um, you know, I had I have used uh, uh, cow urine. Um, that one didn't work out well. I was doing too much, and and that one didn't work. Um, I'm I'm key to maybe try that again in the future. Um, but you know, but then I found uh, a video on how Maasai shields were produced, and it was very similar. Uh, the only step, the only different step, it, is is the addition of um, ashes. They used they took uh, wood ash, and before they scraped it, or after they scraped it, after after they after they they scraped it and cleaned it, they covered it with a wood ash. Um, and, and and then help then then dried it and um and in my in my experience that seems to make it just a little bit tougher um but but yeah so so it's, it's there's all different kinds of methods um the the, the east african shields uh, uh the goshen they are actually placed on a wooden form and then hammered um the the zulu the the, the maasai they actually they ha they 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 take a wooden mallet and they beat the shield as well, um, apparently, which toughens it. Um, and then the, it says that the gashing on the form is hammered repeatedly, which toughens it as well. So, so, so that's that's a little bit about how you know, as far as what I know, construction methods. Um, to take the second part of that, and if anyone wants to jump in, so. Um, Going by uh, like 19th century accounts, there's one mention, at least one mention, of uh, Ethiopian shields uh, being used during uh, during combat. And so, we, of course, we've read Burton, who spoke disparagingly about the the Abyssinian warriors and their shield use and their sword fighting with their shields, and how slow and how you know unmatched it was against Victorian swordsmanship. There was another explorer in Ethiopia, and I believe it was I believe it was Ryder. Um, and I, I can get that information coming back, but he actually spoke quite, uh, he was quite impressed 
by the Abyssinian shields, the Gasha. Um, he said that against the saber, well, one he praised the uh, he praised the Abyssin Abyssinians for their ability to um, use the shield, their ability to to deflect ang to create certain angles of deflection. Um, I can't remember exactly word for word, but he spoke from his description. He spoke of a very active use of the shield as opposed to a very stationary, you know, passive use of the shield. But he said that against the sabers, the Ethiopian shield was proof against it. And he says a lot of time on the battlefield, what you would see is you would find a warrior who had been shot, but his shield had been like slashed like 20 or 30 times, showing that it was proof against their sabers. The one thing he said that it was they were prone to um, to fail into was was bayonets. Um, mm. um, and then, you know, which, you know, makes sense if we're talking about a reinforced like, you know, triangular shaped blade, you know, hitting it at the hitting that shield at the right angle. Um, it could, it could, you know, pierce through. And again, one of the, the Tariq's, uh, the, the Sudanese Chronicles, they mention um, a warrior who had his fingers cut um, due to his shield being split by a sword. So, I mean, they, they, they definitely, you know, with repeated use, they're, they're not invincible. Nothing is invincible. But I think that um, what we, what I'm kind of picking up from the use of high shields is a very, very active form of fencing that smothers and envelops the attacks before they actually are able to kind of gain um, their full their full strength. Uh, a great example, and going back to the to the uh, to the IR, um, that that shield in particular, there's a, there's a few clips of Tuareg um, uh, uh, sword and shield fencing, and you see kind of that, like the 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 shield almost serves as like a I don't know if you go like swing swing a stick at a at a sheet or a blanket that's hanging up, and the 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 the, the motion kind of disrupts your your um, your swing, you know. So I think that yeah. they one way you know function in in that in that manner. Um, yeah, but yeah, yeah. But but much yeah, much more of a disrupt uh, uh, deflection than, than a block. Um, you yeah. know, when, when I when I'm when I'm teaching you know stick fighting. Um, to, to people, you know, I, I teach there's there's blocks, you know, there's parries, there's deflections, and there's there's, there's disruptions. Um, you know, a, a, you know, a, a lot of times, like you said, if you can, if you can get some kind of contact with your opponent's blade at the start of their strike, by the time it gets to you, it, it, it's there's nothing on it. There's nothing right. on it. And I will say also that that. Even with the shield, body movement is still an important important aspect of the defense. So you're you're never just like I've never really just seen unless, uh, uh, yeah, I've never really seen where you're stationary just taking shots. Like you're always moving. It's it's always kind of a cover that's kind of um, uh, closing a line as you're still moving and and protecting yourself through your movement. So I think it's all those things kind of working together that creates that 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 very mobile agile defense mm -hmm. yeah yeah because like with the shields like i'll i'll go jump into south africa you know talk about you know the shield work with you know with that they use and it's like they really especially the shaka's reforms when he made the shield bigger and things like that you see them move in and they use the shield to pin they use the shield to hide their movements you know the shield is over here, but I'm, you know, over here. So you're attacking the shield. You're not attacking me. And it's like, like I said, these things are pretty lightweight despite their size. So it's mm -hmm. like, I can move actively with this. And then here is an item that you can't easily defeat. You can't, you know, besides like the bayonet and stuff where you're talking about every, you know, late, you know, metal working and things like that, you know, in the industrial age and things, you know, you're not going to get through my shield. And so I can take advantage of that. I can press up on you or I can, you know, hide attacks from my shield. You see people throwing javelins and stuff. If you go to like, um, like Toreg or the Sahel or things like that, using their shield as a base for attacks, um, holding weapons behind your shield. That's really like, it's like a whole weapon system because mm -hmm. it's like your shield, if that's your primary defense, but it's also your primary way to engage a target too. So, you know, the shield play that you see, 
um, you know, all throughout Africa, not to generalize, is, is dynamic because, you know, you have this very tough material that you're putting in front of yourself, but they also, you know, have that same thing because you're fighting other people with shields. And then uh, you can talk about weapons like the Chotel, you know, where it's like it's made to get around it because it's easier to get around it than trying to fight through that, you know, thick piece of hide or wicker or wood or whatever it is, you know. So I think that's like, you know, with Hama, that's one of the unique things is that, you know, this shield work, it comes, you know, it com it's, comes a little different, you know. These different regions and stuff, this is a whole different way of warfare, you know. And uh, you look at accounts and especially against foreign armies and things like that. And they'll say like, you know, African forces are, you know, highly skilled or, you know, very mobile, things like that. The British and they fought the Zulu said, treat them as cavalry because they would run from one in the battlefield to the other, you know, fight a battle, leave and run away. And so, uh, you know, like that, you know, the shield plays into that. Because if you're bogged down, if you have heavy infantry, if you have all of these, you know, really uh, resource heavy technologies and things like that, you can't move like that. You can't have an army march 40 miles in a day. Like that stuff is not really possible. So, you know, the shield is kind of like a gateway to understanding just, you know, the different aspects of African warfare in general. Um, and that's why, you know, part of reason I wanted to do this video and things like that, because it's really interesting because once you understand that, you can start tying in the different elements. Well, absolutely. Right. And just so weigh in as well, I mean, if we take a look at North Africa, you can talk about the Libu or the Libyans in Hannibal's time. And they were noted for being mobile with their shields and their javelins. Um, even the Numidians, the same thing. Uh, you know, they're not looking to sit there and slug it out with anybody. Um, you know, they're looking to move in, get what they need done, and then pull out quickly again, right? Um, so that's so so. I mean, that 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 importance of being light and you know moving quickly that all shows up in the in the armor in the way the shields are used, and even in the weaponry. I mean, you don't mm -hmm. really see a lot of examples of African warriors who plan to sit there and slug it out because it just doesn't make sense when you can just move and not be hit. Yeah. yeah. Especially if you're not yeah. wearing a lot of armor. Yeah. yeah. There, there, was, there was an account, <clears throat> I believe, of a, I believe it was Congo warriors, and they talked about... Um, you know, and, and it's funny. You know, you, you read these accounts, and they're like, "Well, they 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 had the sword, but they knew they didn't know anything about this about defense with the sword. Um, they just got out of the way the strikes. Mm. Like, well, well, who needs to block if you, I'm gonna just move before you hit me? You, you know, like you know, they, they talked about the evasive, you know, leaps and 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 body movements. You know, um, but they they wouldn't block, and and. and it makes much more sense, um, you know. African African iron um, is. I, I've heard, you know, I, I'm not into metallurgy, um, but I heard African. You know, a lot of people. I've heard disparaging things about African iron. I've heard, you know, superior things about African iron. But through the bloomery process, it's a very high carbonated iron. It's not steel, but it's very high carbonated. Um, but you don't want to take your iron blade and possibly damage it blocking another another weapon so it's much more you know it's much more conducive for you just to get out the way you know I, I'm, I'm not going to sit there and duel with you and then now my weapon is you know at the end of the, the, the duel I can't I can't even cut you if I wanted to because my, now my weapon is dull so I'd rather get out the way and then cut you get out the way and then, and then, and then cut you so I'm going to jump off on that real quick because that, that really is an important tie in to the diaspora because those those defensive tactics of the Nsanga and the Angola, these are the rituals that the warriors in Central Africa would use to develop that ability to evade, to dodge, to slip, to void, and then, um, you know, find their openings. These like laid the foundations for the fighting arts of Capoeira, of Damier, of Escrima con Machete, of Tira Machete, of all these, these, these um, fighting arts we find in a diaspora, it has its root in this, in this, in this 
style of, of warfare we find in Central Africa. And what was interesting is that many of the infantry, especially the in Bengala and the Jaga, they didn't use shields. They specialized in this, and they were professional soldiers. They specialized in this style of this way of fighting. And um, it's just really interesting because I want to throw that out there because with the absence of the shield in that case for many of those warriors, the way that they would, um, the way that they approached bat war, uh, the battlefield was a little looser. So there wasn't like these really large, you know, uh, formations that were doing all of these Alexander style maneuvers. They arranged themselves in very loose order in skirmishing lines. There was a, a an initial um, missile or archery phase where they would shoot and throw throw spears and they would and they they the the jesuit priest describes like their personal def their defense depended on developing these movements and so uh professor thornton goes into more depth about how they would arrange themselves and how that they would use you know their ability they arrange themselves in these open orders so that they were able to avoid the initial um uh, ranged combat, and then they would go into close quarters. And when they went into close quarters, they didn't have a shield. They weren't fighting in formations, so it was almost like I won't, won't say one to one on one combat, but your defense depended on your personal maneuver. And I think that when we're looking at sometimes when we're looking at um, European accounts of African armies, you know, from the Europe, we have to like take things with a grain of salt because you know the Europeans had a certain way they envisioned how war was conducted, right? And so when they see these guys in these open lines, they may be like, oh, well, you know, they don't really know how to, you know, create a- A, a, a shield a, wall, a, yeah. A shield, wall. Like a shield wall. Right, yeah. And that wasn't the case, you know, it's just that's that's their style of warfare. I mean, same with like, the, I think it was the army of Dahomey. Um, they mentioned that they were like chaotic when they were like, you know, moving from what was like they were chaotic on the battlefield or something, but they were very orderly when they were moving to the battle. You know, so it's like, you know, unfortunately for us, we're having to like when we're looking at this stuff, we're having to look sometimes. Like onion. Yeah, we have to peel those layers off like the onion. Yeah. yeah. And, and then yeah. when you see like especially like with the European accounts, if they see if they don't see basically, you know, themselves like a lot of those accounts are just going to say like, it's weird. What are they doing? Yeah, and, you, know, you got to shift through that. But um, one thing I, you know, that you mentioned, kind of, but I just kind of wanted to bring it up, is uh, just the skill of all of these different armies and warrior groups. Because when you go from region to region, and this, and this is like, you know, not just African, but just throughout the world. When you're, you know, when you live near someone, you know, you're going to have similar practices and things like that. Just the environment and the cultures interact with each other and things like that. So really, when you're dealing with army, especially like, so I could go to, you know, the Sahel, you know, you have the great empires of the Sahel. If you look at that, you have, you know, Mali versus, you know, Chad and all these other places. They might not have, you know, a technological ace in the hole over the other group. But what they are going to have is they're going to have, you know, warrior societies, hunter groups, things like that. They're going to have their elites. And so there's this focus when you look at all the different arts, all the different styles on skill, skill level. You know, the Zulu organized their warriors by skill and age and rank. You know, you have certain, you know, what you could almost call like special forces that you see in different empires where it's like, you know, we have our main army coming from the common folk, but, you know, if we really need to, we're going to commit these guys. And it's like, are they armed differently than the general populace? They might have some special stuff that's like kind to you, but they're still using shields and swords and spears. But the skill level is different. You know, it's not like the, you know, like the knight where it's like you see some guy in, you know, heavy armor and things like that. And it's like, okay, that guy has, you know, advantage over me. It's like, oh, those are the hunters or so-and-so. Those are the best archers in the realm. Let's not mess with them because their skill level is so much higher than us. Yeah. And so you have all of these social organizations and things that play in um, part with the, you know, the cohesiveness of the armies and the fluidity you see in the movements and things like that. And then also um, a lot of these groups interact with each other. So maybe like, for example, 
Egypt would use Nubian archers, you know, and their armies. And because they, even though the Egyptians themselves had archers, they said, your archery techniques are superior to ours. We like using you or, you know, you'll see like slingers from this area or, you know, the javelins throwers from this area are better. And they interact with each other and, you know, or Toregs are really good cavalrymen. So it's like, you know, a Sahelian army will try to use them to attack a rival because it's like, y'all have the best horsemen, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, that's another thing. It's like just this highlight on skill and tactics and movement, you know, and just like how unique you can make your thing, you know, when you're dealing with not so much these different technological differences, but more so like cultural and warrior tradition differences. So, yeah. I, I think also oh, the, you see this throughout these in throughout the Islamic world in North and East Africa as well. And specifically, I'm talking about the Swahili coast, where they would um, often conscript, hire, levy, um, enslave bodyguards from different parts of Africa, specifically because they knew that this group was known for having, you know, a certain type of a certain type of fighter. A great example is the Black Guard of Prince Ismail. And the Black Guard, interestingly enough, as a side point, are still considered to be the royal bodyguards of Morocco's royal family today. You can actually Google images and see them throughout the palace. And, uh, you know, there was, I think, at their peak, there was about 100,000 of them. And they were highly trained with uh, fighting with spear, shield, and sword. They were absolutely ruthless. If somebody told you that the Black Guard was coming, you usually had a good idea that it was going to be a bad day for you. Um, and that's largely because they had an elite class of warriors that they, that they would train and pick and raise. And you see that as well in Egypt with the Mamluks, uh, it's the same thing. You know, they brought their, uh, their, their, their Kipchak turquoise, they raised them and trained them in the uh, medieval Egyptian way of combat, and they became the elite soldiers. I wanted to throw in also just in, and this is kind of an, an overlooked and an under-researched area, and I'm, I'm kind of working on some stuff on this, but there were also the um, the ideas of the heroic ethos in many uh, Sahelian cultures. Some of these things are just kind of part and parcel of just being considered um, a, a, a living individual within this, within this society. So you take like the ethics of uh, Pulaku, the way of being a of being a pula or being a fulani, it has the same tenets that you will find in many like heroic cultures. But um, in some of the the uh, Mende speaking uh, communities, they had these el elite uh, soldiers, warriors, heroes, or we considered heroes or whatever, depending on what side of the fence you were on. These um, these uh, I guess I would say they're like military aristocrats in a sense. The they're called um, Nyancho or Siedu in like the Wolof speaking areas. They're called Siedu, uh, Nyancho, um, or the Thiedu. These were all like um, their their main percent profession was war. Like that was their that was their sport during the times of of peace and during the times of war. You know they would they would go and fight. So there's like many um, poems and stories about these guys going. You know they'll. It's like it's crazy. It's like uh, there's uh, there's the stories of the guys like their the, the the guy's wife's like oh man it's like I, I can never eat you know basi which is a form it was like a it's like a, a cereal like a food like a food um, a food made from like uh, millet that they would eat in the area and she's like I can't eat you know basi anymore. You know, the, uh, not from, not from the milk from this city. I got to have milk from from cows from this city. So her husband <laughs> would have to go ride out, fight a campaign against the city, and bring back you know these 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 cows for his wife. So you got stories like this where you know guys will go on this. It's almost like this 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 chivalrous you know uh, quest in order to like prove their valor or to right a wrong or to do something completely frivolous based off of these these different concepts of honor and so um whereas in some areas you may not find standing armies per se but you do have this this warrior ethos that's in sometimes kind of part and parcel of the culture and sometimes you have these these more um elite cast of warriors as well so 
Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Um, I wanted to take a second and talk about um an underrated shield, but it's it's one of my favorites. Um we're gonna talk about the Donga hand shield. Um, th this, you know, the, the Donga hand, hand shield, uh, f for me is, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's exceptional for me. Um, as, as you know, God, God, as you guys know, I, I'm a part of the SCA. Um, I portray an African warrior in the SCA and I, I basically fight polar. Um, and, you know, and, and so I've always thought of, you know, you know, a, a lot of the, the European guys, they have gauntlets, you know, they have, they have actual hand finger protection um and this is one of the only you know forms of individual armor you know because they actually they, they put those on their hands so they wear those on their hands and i would call that more armor than i would a shield um but 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 it, but it holds a special place in between for me um because this they're cool uh, you know, when you when you look at them, you look at them. now, Demond. You you mentioned how you know uh, some of the Sahel guys, the House of guys, uh, they, they block so confidently. Uh, you know, with, with with putting their hands out there. I mean, I've I've had my hands just destroyed. You know, um, and and I, and I know how I know how one good hit to the pinky will affect your fighting for the next three practices. You know. Uh, so, so I, that, I, I want to bring uh, special attention to, to to the small hand guards of the uh, <laughs> Donga people, the discernment people. You know? Yeah, because because they're you know they fight butt ass naked, except for something <laughs> on their hands. All right, so that's just you know that that that, that strikes me. <laughs> I do like some that of is, the. Um, that is bravery. That is bravery. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I do like just kind of from an aesthetic. Um, I like some of there. I like some of the the more organic forms of armor, and this is like one of those examples of like using. It looks like they're using some kind of like maybe uh, several layers, of like I'm um, palm wrapped with some kind of um, uh, cloth or or, or whatnot. Um, and you'll see, and I'm talking more like the 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 uh, the the forearm protection and mm -hmm. the elbow protection. And then sometimes the hair protection is made in the same kind of way, and I really like yeah. that 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 form of um, the idea of like you know protection. It's it's cool, but they are like they are uh, fearless too, because I I wouldn't be fighting. But like ass that. naked. But ass yeah, naked. that's a lot of that's a lot of trust. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, um, I, I do want to give some credit because they're technically not fighting super naked. If you notice, they have all those reed protections all the way up their arms almost like basil bands they make wicker head guards i mean they're wearing some armor just but some okay. some, some of them are doing that not all of them but they they don't got no crotch protection as well but say. their their butts are out okay they call it it's called the donga it's called the donga all right so oh my God. Yeah, yeah. that's how it goes down that's how it yeah. goes down that's how it yeah, goes yeah. down i i, uh, I had there were certain pictures I, I I had to look through the pictures to find ones that I that I that I could uh that that I could put up. Yeah. 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 But uh going back to the house of man, um I think part of the reason why they do that because it is connected to the um it is connected to the uh the Yantari uh iron skin, tough skin uh ritual. So like, you know, maybe that's part of the reason why they're so bravely um, uh, you know, fighting in a way that, you know, and I think that part of it is like, it goes back to the active use of the shield. I think that they are most of the time very actively using that to intercept the attacks as opposed yeah. to just kind of catching it and letting it roll to their hands. Um, but I think, yeah, sorry, we missed a question. Uh, uh, it was just a, uh, a, a comment. It comment. was a okay. loving conversation. Yeah. No, Thank someone you. asked us about um, Sahelian uh, oh, oh, uh, Yeah, I can speak was, to that. Yeah, it was more, more of a just an agreement. Sah Sahelian ethos are similar to Euro Knights mm -hmm. tales or Arabian poems, war poems. Yeah, most yeah. definitely. Yeah. Most definitely. Yeah. And even uh, the way they fought were basically 
the main army would be doing their thing. They would like go out and duel each other, but like they would like throw javelins at each other. You see a lot in like, uh, you know, horse based cultures where they kind of like separate that if they have infantry to infantry from the riders, because the riders are a higher class. And so basically it's like, you know, for, for you know, your normal soldier to go out on the battlefield, they fight the army. For them, when they go on the battlefield, I'm fighting, you know, Dave, because I don't like him. Like, you know, and so they're challenging each other and, they're, you know, they're riding around and, that you know, they would hurl javelins at each other. And, you know, those javelins are no joke. And you actually see it in the uh, the armor they wear. They have uh, neck protection, you know, kind of all the, the arm pieces have like a little square that extends just to protect the back of the neck. So someone can't come behind you and just like hit you. But uh, yeah, it, it's similar to knights where it's like you kind of, they're kind of like royals, you know, or they're, you know, elevated people and they kind of do their own thing. Now, uh, so they're either, you know, throwing javelins or they would charge. So. And just to kind of piggyback off of that. So just going back to the ethos uh, of the, in the Sahel, what you'll find in many of the, in, in the, um, the epics is there's this there's a strong sense of hospitality and courtesy even amongst people that you're about to like you know fight and possibly kill like so for there's a there's a, a hospitality thing like so if you uh, if I'm gonna go raid Osa's you know village man I, I roll up with my people to Osa's town and like Osa's like hey man that's Damon blah 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 I recognize him as a noble as a hero you would think we would just I sit in my camp and they stay in their city and we just like fight in the morning. No, also would invite me and all my people in. We'd drink together, we'd eat together. The next day we'd be fighting. And that was kind of one of those, one of those ethos, those ethic things. And this is like, you know, when we're reading about these things, we're not saying that this is actually what happened, but it's like this, it's like, it's like hyperbole, it's uh, it's hyperbolic of, of, of expressing like the idea of courtesy and hospitality. Um, another thing is if me, me and Osa, we about to fight, I'm like, you know, hey, let's get it on. And like uh, I show up and Osa shows up and Osa got this sword that's like, you know, kind of rusty and chipped and stuff. And I got this really nice, you know, blade. I got two of them or whatever. Part of the part of the eth- part of the 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 ethos is like I want to fight him as an equal. You know what I'm saying? So like if he has a weapon that's not superior, that's not equal to mine, you know, that's not really a fight. So like yeah. part of that honor is like, you know, hey, it's not a victory, you know? Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's one thing I do like about the SCA. Um, you know, it, it's it, it's suppo- uh, one of the things is the, the medieval times that it should have been, you know, it's, it's one of the catchphrases, you know. Um, but, you know, w- when when you have the, the duels, you have the tournaments and it's, it's one-on-one, the, 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 the chivalry, you know, the the, you know, making sure that your opponent is not looking directly into the sun, you know, um, in one on one situations. Like so, in the SCA, if, if if I hit you in the leg, your leg, you take a knee and you fight from your knee, and and people will make sure that you know the opponent, this, you know, if I'm fighting you on your on your knees, that the sun is not over my shoulder, in your face, and you can't see. So they'll walk around so you can turn around, and then now you know nobody's looking directly into the sun. Um, and, and that's you know, and and that'll get a big you know, viva everybody from the crowd and ovation. Um, but that's you know, that's how war, you know, that that's the best part of war. From you know, it's not a good part of war, but like you know, that that's the part of war, the the rom- romanticism of war. Um, right. That 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 you need in order to deal with the barbaric nature of war i mean right, you're right. you're gonna cut this dude in half if you get the chance you know um it, it, there's a there's a scene in uh the patriot uh uh is the patriot that the, the the what's his name mel gibson mel gibson at the end and the french guy comes out of his tent and he's sharp you know and, and and he's looking at him like like what what are you doing he's like if i die today gonna look good like that's you know it's about to be very barbaric man like can can we be can we find some civility in this in in these acts of of, of barbarity so yeah yeah, that that's definitely um you know is the is the 
you know, a, a, I I appreciate that aspect, and I would I would gladly, you know, bring my my opponent in and eat. You know, I I need to I need to know who I'm about to kill. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I, I do. Yeah. yeah, and and even like just uh, you know, so so that's not on your conscience, you know, because it's like you're you're like, well, I did all the things, you know, you know, he came, you know, I fed him, blah blah blue. It's like also just kind of like a cultural way of kind of like putting war into context because it's like, without that you have chaos. And it's like, if I need an alliance with these people, you know, and I just left their bodies out on the battlefield and stuff like, you know, rather than it's like, we observed your customs, you observed ours, yes, you know, yes, we can yes, talk about yes. it. You know, we can come, this is not forever, you know? Yeah. So that's an aspect too. So we, we have a uh, group from a uh, group. We have a question from our uh, brother DC Overby over at uh, the Black Phalanx. His uh, his group. They do modern. Um, well, uh, not modern, but they do um, colonial col colonial gunpowder, uh, uh, World War One reconstruction, Civil War, Revolutionary War, uh, reconstruction, uh, re re construct uh, re of African people. Um, that's the brother DC. And his question was the groups you study are mostly from West Africa or from all over the whole continent? Whole continent. Whole yeah, continent, DC. We do everybody. From everybody. the ruler to the tutor, DC. From, from the ruler to the tutor, uh, uh, you know, we, we do the um, diaspora. You know, we, 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 we talk about, you know, Axum over there in Yemen. We talk about the Moors up there in Spain. You know, we talk about Mal Madagascar. Uh, uh, we talk about all of the, you know, the, the, the brothers over it in North and, and South America. Um, we pretty much stop there. We do not go, um, East too far. You know, we, we will talk about, you know, certain, uh, uh, Sudanic people who wound up in the Middle East. Um, but we, we don't do, we don't, we, we don't go to Australia. Um, you know, we don't do those brothers over there. We don't do the brothers in Fiji Islands. Um, you know, it, 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 but but we 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 do north, south, east, west, all the way around. All the way recent around. and the recent diaspora, not like the yes. the long, long time diaspora. Yes, um, yes. Uh, well said. Also, we need the romanticism of war to balance the barbarity of war, and uh, that's Dan Lynn. Dan is a uh, is a fellow SEA person. Yeah. Um, Rand Jacobs is here. Rand said hello. He says hello. What's hey, up, Rand? Hey. How you doing? Hey. Um, hey, loving the conversations. Up, Got some good, uh, some good, good comments here, folks. Nice, um, nice, nice. nice. So, fellas, we we've come up on an hour here. Um, our our our, our goal was, was was an hour. You know, I, I think we 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 hit we hit it here. Um. You know, someone. Wait, we got one question. Have you got? Here we go. This is from uh, Jamal. Uh, have you guys thought about doing a weekly podcast? It's a good idea. It's a good idea. Maybe Jamal. Well, you know, uh -huh. might, might. Um, but but I definitely see a part two to this conversation. Um, you know, I I think what well, you know we're going to take Kari's advice or Kari's suggestion, and we're going to set up the uh the Hama Shield page. Um, you know, and, and where we can just basically just discuss shields, um, their, their uses and, and any questions people have, we'll be able to jump on there. And then, you know, maybe uh, the, the next series, we'll, we'll just, we'll stick to regions next time, you know, or, or just certain cultures or certain shields. We might just do straight up do mass size shields next time. Um, you know, or, or we'll just say East Africa next time. Um, but uh, you no, know, gentlemen. I, I, you know, in any any closing any closing remarks, gentlemen. Demond, go first. Well, you put me on the spot, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, nothing closing. I just it was an honor to be here. Glad we were able to kind of connect and uh, talk about this. Uh, Kari, you know, much respect for coming up with the topic. Osa, thank you for putting this together. And Monza, your presence is always a blessing. So yeah, happy to be here. Monza. Well, uh, this I, I'll, I'll put this as a challenge to everybody watching the channel. Go out and do some more research on different African shields. You'll find, even though in many places there are similarities, you'll find amazing diversity, brilliant ideas for how shields are used, 
You'll find different materials that you could use different ways that uh, different meanings that shields might have and the, and the art and the culture. Uh, shields aren't just a thing you put in front of something somebody swings at you. There's a lot more tied to it. So I, I hope that this gives you the opportunity or gives you some ideas for you to go out and do some more of your own research. It's a pleasure always to connect with you guys and share this information. And, uh, you know, one love. <laughs> Corey? Um, I just think this was a great discussion. I think, you know, the goals I set forth are just kind of given a general overview. I think we did. And, you know, we'll have the Facebook page and you can ask us questions and stuff. And I'm just really happy with the outcome. So, you know, I'm glad everyone who listened, you know, you know, enjoyed what we spoke about. Same here, same here. All right, gentlemen, I want to oh, thank thing, you. For one more thing, one more thing. Get your hammer teas from Teespring. <laughs> Who's that? Yeah, we have this one teams too. Well, what shirt? Oh, what shirt is, is that, man? Emperor Haile Selassie. Okay. Yeah, we got Emperor Haile Selassie right here. So right. Uh, the shirts are images of Africa's greatest heroes. So please get your get yours at Teespring. We ship worldwide. And, and Massa, I have I have the commercial. I will play the commercial at the end of the broadcast. <laughs> okay. So, gentlemen, I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, as as I as as I can and you can you can hang out, but uh, I'm I'm going to go ahead and sign off. So uh, that was that was an amazing time. I want to thank all of our viewers, um, everyone that chimed in. Um, this was the first time that we've been back uh since uh since the pandemic hit. I I, I believe this is our it's our first show. So I I want to thank everyone who who um who. Especially the folks who who gave us submitted questions and comments, um, you know, without you folks, we're we're just we're just talking to each other. So I just want to say thank you all, and uh, please pay attention. Uh, I'm going to try to put in the comments or, or the descriptions once we get the page, uh, the skill page together. I'm going to put that how you can find it in the comments and descriptions. Thank you very much, folks. You have a good day. The Historical African Martial Arts Association's Hero Series celebrates the great military leaders of Africa's past. Order yours today at teespring.com.